Hey everyone, so this is part three of chapter one. It's the last section of chapter one. Um, some basic information here over cells, their size and their shape. Uh, cells, as you may remember from your high school biology class, are the smallest units of life. They do vary considerably in size. Um, for example, an ovum, which is a, a female egg, has a diameter of about 150 micro, uh, micrometers, and, and the red blood cell has a diameter diameter of about seven and a half. So pretty considerable size difference there when it comes to size. Um, all cells are microscopic, so you would not ever be able to see them uh, with a naked eye. If you wanted to differentiate cell types, you would definitely need a microscope to do so. They also differ notably in shape. There are flat cells, brick-shaped cells, irregular uh, shaped cells, thread-like cells. There's a bunch of different types. Um, of, excuse me, a bunch of different shapes of cells, and they all perform activities necessary to maintain life. So things like meta uh, metabolism and assimilation, digestion, excretion, and reproduction. So every cell in your body, um, the takeaway from that section is that every cell in your body has a specific job to do in your body, um, and that job is to help keep you alive in some capacity, uh, even though the cells are different in shape and in size. And tissues have, there are several different types of tissues as well that you need to know about. So epithelial tissues cover and uh, their function or their job, their primary role is to cover and protect parts of the body. They typically cover the body on uh, and line the inside of the body cavities. They are the second most abundant tissue and that is because there are several kinds of them throughout the body. Um, you have connective tissue. Connective tissue's job, its primary role is to bind and support other tissues, as you might guess from the word connective. Um, it is the most abundant tissue in the body. It is most widely distributed tissue in the body as well. And there are also multiple types of connective tissue, um, and they have different appearances and they have different functions. So depending on what it is that it's connecting, what body parts or structures it's connecting, the appearance and the function uh, will differ. Muscle facilitates movement. That's its primary job. You have a few types of muscle tissue that you should be aware of as well. There's skeletal muscle tissue. So skeletal muscle tissue attaches to bones. It is also sometimes called striated or voluntary, and that is because control of the skeletal muscle tissue is voluntary. You can decide whether or not you want to move the muscles that are attached to your skeleton. Um, striations become apparent when they are viewed under a microscope. We will get much more into muscle types of tissues and, you know, skeletal muscle tissue and things as we progress through the course. This is just a very basic overview of the muscle types, so kind of keep that in mind. Cardiac muscle tissue uh, is also called striated. However, it is involuntary. Um, it does come, it kind of makes up the heart wall, and it's called involuntary because you can't really control contractions. Um, normally, your heart in, in a healthy functioning heart, you can't control whether or not it beats, and so that muscle is just constantly um, moving, and so it is involuntary. The last type of muscle, 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 oh my gosh, muscle is smooth muscle tissue. It is also called non-striated or visceral. Um, it is also involuntary. So these striations are kind of like grooves or lines in the muscle tissue, and um, smooth muscle then would not have those because it's smooth. Um, and so it doesn't really have any cross striations. It's often found in blood vessels and other uh, tube-shaped organs or organs that have hollow openings. Okay, so the last uh, type of tissue is nervous tissue, and this tissue connects sensory structures to motor structures. So what that does is helps to facilitate rapid communication between body structures and also helps aid in the control of body functions. So a bunch of cells put together make tissues, a bunch of tissues put together then make organs, and organs are basically where a bunch of cells um, and tissues link up and they create this uh, structure that serves a common function. So for example, the cells in the heart function to keep 
the blood flowing. And so we're going to talk much more about body systems as we go through the course, but I wanted to put this chart in here for you um, to give you kind of a point of reference. So you are going to need to know what components or structures are within each system and what the functions of those are um, throughout this course. So the nervous system, um, you know, I'm not going to read through all of these, but you can see there is composed of the um, cerebrum, the medulla, the spinal cord, and the nerves, the heart, uh, arteries, veins, capillaries, and blood are what make up the cardiovascular and circul circulatory systems, um, and so on and so forth. So you're definitely going to want to take note of this chart. I definitely suggest making flashcards out of this to help you study for your exam. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second, put the next, uh, the last page of this lecture up, and I'll be right back. All right, so the last page of this lecture is a very quick overview on homeostasis and feedback loops. Okay, so I paused it for a second and found a picture um, to give you kind of a visualization of how homeostasis works. So um, it is the relative constancy of the internal environment. And so if you look at this picture of this old scale, um, it the goal of homeostasis would be to keep these even. Now, obviously, if we put more uh, substances or weight on one side, the scale would tip and one side would be higher than the other side. Um, but if we took some of that weight off, then they would be even. And that's kind of how homeostasis works. You want it to be um, constantly even, as, as even as possible. This is um, because our survival, um, survival of us as individuals and of the genes that make up our body is super important. Um, you know, I mean, the goal is to kind of try to stay as healthy as possible and alive. Um, and our survival depends on the maintenance or the restoration of that balance or homeostasis. So the way that our body does this is by using things called feedback loops. And these are super important to know about. Um, you definitely want to make note of this uh, flashcards or something um, to help you study. Our body normally uses, um, more often than not, we'll use a negative feedback loop. And that is a feedback loop that is designed to reverse the direction of a change in a physiological system. So for example, um, say you drink a Mountain Dew and that causes your blood glucose or blood sugar level to spike up. What's going to happen then is that is going to cause your pancreas to be like, hey, the blood sugar is too high, so I'm going to release more insulin and stop releasing so much glucagon. That action, that physiological response of the pancreas releasing insulin to counteract the elevated blood sugar is going to cause the cells to remove glucose from the blood and convert it to glycogen. Now, once all of that is done, your blood sugar level or your blood glucose level should be back down to about a normal stage. And so you have again achieved homeostasis. Now, Say we go the opposite way and you don't eat. You haven't eaten all day and suddenly you're starting to feel lightheaded, a little shaky, and you realize that your blood glucose has decreased. You have low blood sugar, right? So if your blood sugar is too low, the pancreas is going to be like, hey, your blood sugar is too low. And so it's going to secrete less insulin and instead going to secrete more glucagon that will prompt cells to convert the glycogen to glucose and release it into the blood, therefore elevate, elevating or bringing up your blood sugar to a normal level. And again, you, you're back at that balanced uh, homeostasis level. So that's kind of how negative feedback loops work. In less often um, instances, we will see positive feedback loops. And those are feedback loops that amplify a change to a physiological system. Um, the example that I think of most often in positive feedback loops is childbirth or labor and delivery. So the goal of labor and delivery is obviously to produce a baby. We want to amplify the physiological change that is the difference between pregnancy and delivery. Sorry about the background noise. Um, so in labor, uh, you know, you a, a woman will go into labor, it's the onset, and throughout this, as she's laboring throughout this process, the cycle will repeat until she has the baby. So her cervix is going to become distended. When her cervix becomes distended or starts to thin out, that's going to stimulate the synthesis of the hormone oxytocin. 
Oxytocin then stimulates uterine contraction. Uterine contractions will then start to push the baby downward. And this whole cycle, the cervix thinning out, the oxytocin making the uterus contract, the contractions pushing the baby downward, is going to continue until the baby is delivered. And so it is amplifying that change um, from, again, being pregnant to delivering the baby. So that's the example of a positive feedback loop. So um, one last quick disclaimer. This again is just a very brief overview to give you some things um, that you want to pay attention to when you are studying. You definitely still need to read the chapters and you still need to go through the PowerPoints and take your own notes um, and make some uh, study guides for your exam. All right, take care.